so let's talk, guys. Uh, <laughs> so five years ago, I remember when I first started here, uh, the big thing, everyone was talking about molecular gastronomy. That is like the hot new thing. That's going to be the future of cooking. And now, what happened? What's going on? I mean, I've never done molecular gastronomy. I mean, I, I use some things, but that's really not my, been my forte. So I don't know if people are getting back to basics or if chefs are just, you know, kind of, you guys could probably speak on that too, kind of thinking about original techniques or pooling from your classic training. I mean, that's really where I pull from. I don't know, what about you guys? Well, <laughs> uh, for, I mean, I worked for, for Wiley at WD-50, and I mean, just to clarify, molecular gastronomy is more about the understanding of the science that goes behind cooking. Right. So. Classic technique is molecular gastronomy. It's just considered, it's not as far, it has not been brought as far forward as foams and gels and, and everything like that. But even, even going further with that, gelatin, you know, and, and is considered a hydrocolloid, which is a classic ingredient in panna cotta, which is a, is a gel. So, I mean, molecular gastronomy is cooking, but it's the science behind it and the understanding is really... I, definition. I, I think what sort of was mistaken was how people consider molecular gastronomy a, a genre of cuisine when sure. it really should be, it's, a, it's techniques right. and yeah. understanding the science. Well, I just don't think it's that much in your face anymore as it was five years ago. I think that it's kind of morphed and adapted itself into using those techniques and using those certain types of ingredients or stabilizers, but also pairing it with local ingredients or locally sourced products and kind of fusing the two from farm to plate along with these new techniques that were created. And I think that that's kind of where, where it's gone in the last five years. I think maybe some people too think molecular gastronomy is all liquid nitrogen, yeah. which it's not. And that's a good point that we've been using these items or things that people think it's all chemicals, I think too, but it's, it's really... The bleach is a chemical. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's misconceptions. So we're in 2011 now. Where do you see the, uh, where are we right now in gastronomy? It, it seems to me it's a reaction. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the economy as well, but this idea of cooking simpler, more rustic, more, uh, something more familiar, that seems to be uh, on the upswing. I mean, I see more people supporting local farms and farmers, which is huge. I mean, everybody wants to say that they're farm to table, but we truly are farm to table. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not, we, I know I personally, and I know you guys too, you try and find the best products that you can. And most of those products are wherever is touching your state. It's whatever is close to you. It, I always say, you, when I travel, I always go where, what you, where can you eat and drink? And, you know, it's what grows together seems to go together. So it seems to make sense. And that's what people have been doing, I think, in cooking. And, I think maybe people are just coming back and it's coming into the homes. Has that always been the case or is that more, are we seeing uh, more the middleman being eliminated from the, uh, the, you know, in the food chain where chefs are going directly and sourcing the ingredients from, from farmers? Has that always been the case or? Um, I don't know. I mean, anytime you can eliminate more hands that are touching your products along the way and really develop a relationship with, with a farmer or someone that's raising cattle or growing something for you, it's a better connection for the chef to the farmer and to the guest because you're getting something at a higher quality. And there's a story behind it. Everybody loves a story behind a certain dish of this farmer grew this specifically for this restaurant. Um, getting rid of the middleman, and there's always going to be middlemen and, and everything. Um, so I, I don't know if that's ever going ever gonna to change, but if we can somehow bring local and organic into everyone's home or bring it onto the forefront of, of what we're doing with you know, politics or you know, moving forward with the food source in America, I think that that's the direction that we need to be going. And I think chefs kind of drive those trends and the restaurant industry drive those trends and everybody seems to, big business seems to get onto it later. Like you find organics in Walmart right now. It's because it's a buzzword. It's, but you know, what, what is it? Is it really organic? What does organic stand for? You know? So what is local and sustainable? What, what's that going to mean in the next five years? You know? When it's at Walmart? When it's at Walmart, <laughs> right. Uh, you, you bring up an interesting point about uh, who- Does that mean we get t-shirts from Walmart? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> on the table? Just keep saying Walmart, you'll be right. your spokesperson. You get a handshake from an old guy and you get some you know, nice asparagus. Um, you talk about driving trends. You know, I wonder, this might be seeming like an abstract question, but 
who, who is driving trends? Do you think it's the diner's reaction or is it the chefs in the kitchen? Like, like who, who drives that? I mean, I, don't, I do a lot of outreach with kids in schools and you'd be surprised how many kids don't know what things are. They don't know what the vegetable is and they don't, they don't know what a carrot looks like, honestly. And it's a little scary. So I don't know if it's we're driving the trends or it's supply and demand or if it's the media, but I don't know. I think it's a little bit difficult to pinpoint from my standpoint because this is what I've always done. This is how I grew up eating, eating from a garden, making our own syrup from maple trees. Like that's how I always try to cook and bring that on to the guest. Mike, have you found that to be uh, something that you've tried that's been... I think it's media is definitely helps drive those trends. I think that they, <clears throat> media looks for the new thing. They, they, they want to break the story. They want to be the first one to present something new to the, to, to the general public. And so, <clears throat> you know, when people are cooking farm to table or foraging or making foams, it's, it's about breaking that story. And that's kind of what makes people aware of what's going on. And then that drives the whole transfer of information. I mean, that's what I get. It's, you, you don't, you don't learn about something because you, you went to El Bulli in, 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 you know, in 99 and like you saw this awesome you know, movement that was going on or this idea and then, and then you know, it, it becomes, the ideas become uh, transferred and then people talk about it and then, and then now it's, it's, it's actually that's how things kind of move with information. And then you have guys like Chris who clarify it for, for the whole mainstream and, and offering, you know, an actual textbook or, or something of that sort. Have you guys seen that book, like thumb through that book It's yet? amazing. I don't personally own it. If anybody wants to give me copies, I'd love it. <laughs> I think it's uh, like six, five hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean, like it's on so. my list of things to get, but it's pretty amazing. I, we were just talking about that it'd be a great textbook for culinary students. And it would cost just about about the same. Yeah, as just included in their tuition. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I want to ask the three of you to uh, just going out. Um, how has has the diners um, taste has that evolved ever since you started cooking? Have they do they eat differently then than do they do now? I'll start with Ryan. Um, I eat differently than I did when I first started cooking. So of course the diners aspect of the restaurant's going to change. I think. A lot of the Food Network and TV shows really brought the culinary scene to the forefront of, you know, um, almost mainstream, which is great for us because people are learning more about food. They're coming into restaurants and asking questions and trying new things. So it gives us the opportunity to push boundaries a little bit or try different things and, and be creative, which goes along with, I think, with the trends is I think sometimes the chef's creativity drives the trend of what's happening and people see something creative that Michael's doing and you know maybe I'll get inspired by that you know and turn it into my own um, with that so yeah it, it's constantly changing the diner's palate is constantly changing your food is constantly changing is there something that you would have cooked that you cook now that you wouldn't have uh, cooked 10 years ago or you think the diners might not have accepted that I cooked 10 years ago that I cook now or yeah well I mean like is, is there a dish now that's uh, or and I'll, I'll open it up to the three of you is there something that you're doing now that you don't think that's uh, you know, your guests, your diners would have been receptive just because it's, uh, they're more educated. Well, I think at Tavernit, I think it's a great point. It's not so much food, but it's uh, the experience that we're offering. In the front bar, we're offering um, a little pincho bar, like a stand and eat San Sebastian style pincho bar. And I think 10 years ago, the concept of someone coming into you know, a casual bar and standing and eating and really trying to capture that Spanish vibe that's happening in, in that region, I, I don't think it would would have worked then. But now it, there's so much with the internet and, and with you know being on such a global market, everybody knows what's happening and everyone's been turned on and people have been traveling and watching traveling shows so that everyone's experienced and, and has knowledge of what's going on in these other countries with cuisine, with customs, um, the things like that. So I want to go uh, elaborate on that, Heather, but uh, this idea that uh, the internet certainly has made it possible for us to uh, know about global cuisine, and I wonder if, if you know, the food that you're serving now, will there will one day there, there will just be no demarcation? It's just <laughs> like Earth food rather than French food or Japanese food. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think it's it's an interesting concept to think about. You know, what type of cuisine are you doing? I think that you, it's hard to pinpoint what kind of restaurant you are. I mean, 
I'm doing like new American small plates. It's social plates. It's something different. When I proposed this idea to our ownership, they were freaked out of half and whole portions and not having entrees and because it's different. But the idea behind the menu is can you hold a drink in one hand? Can you eat food with another? So I don't have a lot of fork and knife items. But what I've really found for my own personal sense of cooking over the past 10 years is that I've really simplified the way that I do things and that I try to use five ingredients or less and that it's very, you know, it's, it's all things that are memorable for me. It's deviled eggs, it's beef jerky, it's things that I've had or things that mean something to me that I twist and turn and make them my own. So those are the things that I like to cook and this, my cuisine might not be for everyone, but the restaurant that I've developed with Sable is really seems to be the menu that I want to cook. By the way, the beef jerky at, Sa at Sable <laughs> is awesome. So uh, do, do go and try. <laughs> it's road trips, Dr. Pepper and beef jerky. That's how it came about. <laughs> That's perfect. Nostalgia. Yes. Uh, Mike, how about you? Uh, in, in 10 years, uh, well, let me ask you about you as a chef. Have you changed your style? How have you evolved as a chef in, in, since you started cooking? Uh, I mean, I've just become more aware of local and seasonal. I mean, not like, uh, obviously, there, I, I have a tendency to, to want it to be creative, but also, you know, stay delicious. I like to present my familiar flavors in unexpected ways. But um, for me, it's, it's been, there's, there's definitely, with, with the, the Green City Market and, and obviously local farms, but it's, it's about finding those. <clears throat> for me, it's been finding, finding and understanding the seasons and then being able to do something that, that satisfies me, not, not always just, I mean, obviously delicious, but uh, intellectually. Because, I mean, for me, when, at a home, I mean, I, I cook very rustic French food, but uh, in the restaurant where, where I spend, you know, 15 to 17 hours a day, I need to challenge myself intellectually as well as, uh, you know, developing my own style and my own voice as well. Do, do you find that, for the three of you, that the less is more credo has become, uh, you've accepted more of that as the more you've, as you matured as a chef, or do you think you're, you know, pushing towards more cre creativity? Well, I mean, Eastern philosophy is, is you know, is, is to simplify. So, I mean, I, I, I definitely embrace that, but it's, you know, like, I do tend to go with five ingredients or less, sometimes three, and, and, and that is, is becomes more memorable and easy to identify for, for the diner, I, I believe, as opposed to overcomplicating something. And then looking at it as a standpoint from a chef, it's like, can that 19-year-old can that cook, can he get 20 ingredients for the salad ready on time, along with the other five items that he has to do for his mise en place? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I, I balance it at, you know? And if I'm gonna have to work that station, do I really want to prepare <laughs> 25 items, you know? So it's, it's kind of one of those, you know, you, you definitely balance what's, what's capable and what's not and what's cost effective. And, and I don't like to muddle my flavors. I feel like when you have t too much going on at once, it's like you lose track of, unless it's extremely, you know, clean and, and, and uh, defined, it's like it's, it's tough for me to, to, to break everything apart. So that's why I, I stick to a very, you know, easy, like, Four ingredients or less. I don't know if this is your creation. This was uh, Paul Kahn's idea, but I think definitely well, the, mine. Definitely, definitely mine. yours. Okay, it's Mike's <laughs> idea, but, but the, I'm not sure if you have any oh, of you yeah. had the the pork belly sandwich at Blackbird. It is like the best sandwich in that Chicago. That was Paul's. That was Paul's. That was Paul's idea. Okay. Well, but 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 really, it's that, that's really the simplest you know idea, and it's you know it's my favorite thing on the menu. Just, Most of just the times, nice I think simple ideas are the best ideas. Right. If you find like an amazing ingredient, like I found this great sorghum from a guy and he had a sorghum patch in Indiana. Well, why would you want to mask those flavors of this amazing product that he just got and he pressed and it, I just, and I want to share that with the guests because we get excited about it. Yeah. It's, we get excited about these little things that we find that are like, you know, maybe nobody else has. I want to ask, uh, let me start with Ryan first, but uh, this, I want to talk about inspiration. We, we have a few minutes left, so uh, where, is your, do you ever get inspiration for your cooking that does not come from food or, or cooking? Yeah, inspiration is everywhere. You know, you just have to be able to see it when, when it's thrown at you. Um, 
You know, I, somebody asked me how, how a chef comes up with ideas, and there really isn't an answer. Sometimes they come in a dream. Sometimes I'll be walking down the street, and I'll just think of these flavors. And sometimes those are the best ideas is when they come from nothing. Um, some of the best dishes that I think, well, I think that I've ever made, you know, um, have come from just me thinking of putting things together. And when I try to force something or I say, you know, I have to come up with something, I really want to use venison or something and really force it, um, it, it always doesn't really have the same result. And just to go back to the three ingredients, I think the restraint of a chef really shows his true talent. If you know he has restraint and uh, doesn't want to put so many ingredients and doesn't want to mask flavors, that's the true testament of a chef, I think. Ideas. Where, where do you get your ideas from? <clears throat> it's Kevin? funny. I think like Ryan, I sleep with a notepad by my bed because often I wake up and I'm like, oh wait, I think this might taste good together. Or I think about something or I think about something that I've had, like I'm working on this idea of a pot pie, but frying it in like a fritter. <laughs> and I'm just, so I think about things that might be fun to eat, but I also, I don't know, I travel a lot. I think probably like you guys, mm -hmm. and you get inspiration from, from, from other parts of the country or regional America or things that mean something to you from your childhood or something you want to try and recreate. I read a lot, not just cooking stuff. I read a lot in general. So I don't know, I think chefs are very creative and you, you're, you know, we're, on, we're, we're forward thinking thinkers and we don't necessarily get bogged down by, by boxes and being put inside restrictions. So chefs don't like restrictions. No. Nobody puts baby in the corner, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mike, have you ever been inspired by, say, music or movies when it comes to creating and conceptualizing a dish? Um, I mean, music's part of kitchen daily life, so that kind of, I think it, it helps to, 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 to open your, you know, yourself up to, to being, to an idea of like, that might come from just looking at, at something and two ingredients that, that'll just be, could be seemingly sitting there in the walk-in or, or somewhere, and, and you'll just suddenly put those together. But uh, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess, Movies, I mean, there hasn't really been, you know, like, Jenna Rush didn't really inspire me. You, you weren't know. inspired by Ratatouille? Ratatouille, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. That's the best I, you know, That's the best right, little little cook movie there is. It is, <laughs> down to the clogs. <laughs> I, was, I was more, you know, I was more taken back with the food memory that, that was there, you know, but I got a little tear in my eye, too, on that one. Well, I think we're about to run out of time, but uh, I'd like to uh, thank Mike Sheeran, Heather Terhoon, and Ryan Pauline, and all our wonderful speakers. Please give them a <laughs> round of applause.